Hello everyone, welcome back to Maverick Mods. Today we're going to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, not really going to do any uh, mechanical or fabrication work on the car today. I'm going to hopefully not bore you too much. Do a little bit of talking. Um, going to do a little bit of writing on a whiteboard and try and put some of my thoughts out there so that you guys have an idea of just where my thought process is. So, here we go. I know it's been a while since I talked about the future of the Firebird. In fact, I think the last time we talked about it, uh, mainly I focused on drivability, engine, LS swap, um, things like that. Today, let's focus on suspension, okay? And why I'm about to do what I'm about to do. So, when we picked up the Z28 donor car, uh, we lucked out and not only did we get a good uh, LS1, good six speed, uh, good interior mostly, um, good uh, wiring harness, a lot of the things we needed for the Firebird or that could be adapted to the Firebird. But another benefit was uh, wound up with mostly, uh, with the exception of one corner of the rear suspension, we got good suspension and uh, so that got me to thinking is there a way to adapt the, the 2000 z28 suspension to the 71 firebird and is does that really help and would it make a difference so let's talk a little bit about uh, what we've got with the base suspension on the firebird so while we're talking about suspension on the, the early generation Camaros and Firebirds, and, and this actually could apply to just about any vehicle of any era. Um, when we're talking about the suspension setups, one of the things you always need to keep in the back of your mind, way back here is, what was the goal? What was the goal of the manufacturer when they were designing the car? Okay. So let's take the uh, uh, F-Body or the Camaro and Firebird platform for an example. And this example would cover just about everything. But let's use that for the example. Ford came out with the Mustang in, call it 64 and a half, uh, and set the American uh, auto world on fire. But we have to think about why, what was Ford's motivation for the Mustang? Was it a sports car? As we would think of a sports car, and the answer was no. Um, it, it was based on the Falcon chassis platform, which was at that time, in the early 60s, was an economy car, for the 1960s anyway. Uh, the reason they did that was because the platform, AKA the chassis, the suspension, was already designed. They didn't go to extraordinary lengths to design a new uh, chassis for the Mustang, they basically just designed a new body to fit on the existing chassis. And I know the Mustang guys are going to, well, they may howl about this, but they know the truth. Uh, it was no great shakes even back then. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, the, the Mustang suspension platform is not the greatest. Uh, even back then, it was not the greatest. And you can spend a ton of money trying to bring uh, a 60s or early 70s era Mustang up to even a reasonable uh, level for even modern street driving. So why am I talking about Mustangs? There's a Firebird sitting here in the shop. But the reason is, is the introduction of the Mustang caught GM flat-footed. And they had to scramble to come up with a competitor. And it wasn't until 67 when both uh, Chevrolet introduced the uh, Camaro and Pontiac introduced the Firebird. And we have now the what they call the F-Body. Um, and so you went from 67 to 69 uh, with the first gen, then from 70 to 73 with the second gen, and from 74 to 81 with the third gen. Or, no, excuse me, that's still the second gen, sorry. So for front suspension on the uh, Firebird here, we have a conventional uh, double wishbone, uh, unequal length arm, 
I'm not going to get into some serious technical terms, um, uh, front, front suspension, and we have leaf spring rear suspension, okay? Uh, so what does that really give us? Uh, I can tell you uh, with all honesty, uh, back in the day when I was racing uh, circle track racing, I got out of doing late models and modifieds uh, because it was just too damned expensive. And frankly, the competitors were just nuts. Um, wreck you to win at any cost. I'm a, just a plain guy buying my own parts, paying for my own car, struggling to get a sponsor to pay for tires and fuel over the weekend. I can't afford for somebody to smash into me every single weekend because he's so obsessed with winning that he doesn't care. So I gravitated to street stocks and I found that the mostly the competition in street stocks was guys just like me. We have jobs, um, we're racing because it's fun, but in the end, you're not going to wreck a guy just to win because you have to pay to repair your own car. Okay, let's get away from that. Uh, and why am I talking about racing? Well, when I was uh, racing street stocks, I kind of had a, an 82 Monte Carlo just fall in my lap, a complete car. Uh, this came out of a junkyard, so it was not usable on the street anymore. It's a perfect platform to turn into a street stock. And when I got it on the track, I was the only, what they call a G-body, the only Monte Carlo on the racetrack. Everybody else was running Camaros. And basically, uh, second generation, uh, 74 to 80 era Camaros. Pretty much until, uh, for the first few years, until I really got my suspension dialed in, consistently, the Camaros could beat me into a corner every single time. But I could beat them off a corner every single time. And what does that mean? I mean, everybody's going, you have lost the plot. Well, here's where I get back to the Firebirds, or in the Camaros and Firebirds. The uh, F-Body platform has a really, for its era, a really good balanced front suspension. Um, that's why they could beat me into the corner because the late model uh, G-Body, Montes, etc. had a really, really poor front suspension. However, I could beat them off the corner because I had a better rear suspension. Uh, I had uh, uh, basically a, a four-link, uh, it's a factory setup, um, kind of a, uh, I forget what they call it, it's not exactly a four-link, but it's sort of a, a four-link. Uh, the term escapes me right now. but. Um, I could hook the back of the car up, whereas the guys in the, the Camaros uh, just flat could not get their rear suspension to hook up. And why is that? Okay. So we're going to go to the whiteboard here. I'm going to try this and see if I can't get my ideas down and make a little bit more sense. All right. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at Camaro, Firebird, front suspension length, double wishbone, coil spring, suspension. In the rear, what do we got? We have leaf springs. This is a good system. And just so everybody knows, there is no such thing as a perfect suspension. Any suspension, front, rear, front and rear, is always a series of compromises. I'm not going to go into a bunch of technical terms. Uh, everybody talks roll centers. They talk about uh, camber gain. They talk about Ackerman angle. They talk about blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to do that. Um, however, I can say that GM got pretty good balance on the front suspension. This is the caveat for its time. Okay. We'll talk about that here in a minute. However, let's talk about the rear suspension. You can't really say much good about leaf springs. The only really good thing about leaf springs is that I can think of from a performance suspension standpoint is you don't need a panhard bar or
You don't need a pan hard bar or a way to laterally locate the rear end. Literally, I have nothing else good to say about leaf springs. All right, so if uh, GM did a really good job on the front suspension on the Camaros Firebirds, um, how come you don't? How come I don't like the rears? Well, again, we need to look at it from the manufacturer standpoint. Why were they building these cars? The concept of a pony car didn't exist until the Mustang came out, and so GM uh, was uh, playing catch up. Uh, and you got to remember. These cars are coming off the line, and the number one uh, criteria, uh, not number one, but one of the up, way, way, way up there and in, in, uh, close to number one criteria for any vehicle that a manufacturer makes is how cheaply can we make it uh, for a price that people will pay for it, okay? They could put the absolute ultimate suspension in it. Uh, they could spend a literal fortune. Uh, you know, there's a Swedish manufacturer called Koenigsegg that they sell their cars for oh, probably over $2 million a piece, but you get literally the best of everything. But not everybody can afford that. So GM had to save some money somewhere. Um, you know, back in the old days, um, in the horse and buggy days, and the early automotive days, uh, cars were just an extension of that they were a horseless carriage and so the front and rear suspension generally were solid beams with leaf springs because that's what the buggies had but things evolved and progressed over time so over the years the manufacturers uh, refined their suspensions um, front suspensions came first because the front suspension has a, a little bit harder job than the rear suspension uh, in a way because the front suspension not only has to suspend the car and keep you from bottoming out and handle the bumps and, and all that and keep the car rolling straight, it also has to, the front wheels have to turn. So it has to be able to handle turning uh, and it has to be able to handle stopping. So the front suspension actually does more than the rears. Um, the rear suspension basically is designed to keep the car pointed straight and keep the rear end from exiting the car. Yeah, I know that's simplified, but so. Uh, a lot more effort was put into designing front suspensions over the years than it was rear suspensions. And now we're back to uh, the uh, 1970s, or excuse me, the 1960s, when GM was designing the F-Body platform. Uh, Lee springs for the rear were a proven commodity they knew how to make it work for what they were designing the car for. Uh, and again, the front suspension, uh, they uh, put extra effort in, maybe they did, maybe they just got lucky, hit it right, but they did a really good job on the front suspension. And I'm gonna put the caveat in there, for its time. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, and I know everybody is gonna hate me for saying this, and they're gonna be howls of protest, bring it on, Pretty much a 2018 Toyota Camry will out accelerate, out handle, and out brake the best that GM or Ford could put out in 1971. Hands down. And there is no, you can't argue with that. The numbers are the numbers. Um, it's just the way it is. That's 50 years of evolution of the automobile. Just like a 1970 any vehicle from any manufacturer was leaps and bounds better than something that came out in 1920, better than a Model T, better than you know any vehicle that came out in 1920. So, uh, how can we take advantage of those of those advances? So, how can we take advantage? of all the advances in automotive technology over the last 50 years. Okay, so remember, this was good for its time. How can we improve the front suspension? Uh, there are 
dozens and dozens and dozens of companies that sell all manner of improvements. We could go with uh, tubular uh, control arms. We can go with, uh, we can get rid of the coil springs and we can go with coil over shocks. Okay. We can improve the steering by uh, faster ratio, better steering box. Okay, what else can we do? We can go with uh, different spindles, drop spindles, uh, better spindles. Okay. Uh, what else can we do? Sway bars. We can go with better sway bars. Okay. We could, if we wanted to, uh, better brakes. Actually, I'm going to leave. No, I'm going to throw brakes in here. Better brakes. Okay. Bigger, better. That's two T's. E S. Better brakes. Okay. Um, slash calipers. All right. In the end, on the front suspension, what do we have that's original and factory, and what don't we have that's original and factory? Okay. Uh, if we go with tubular control arms, they're not factory anymore. Coilover shocks, they're not factory anymore. Ste steering box, yes, we go with a faster ratio box. Okay, that that's still factory. Spindles, uh, no, that's kind of a yes and a no, it depends. Um, sway bars, that's not factory anymore. It's designed like a factory bar, but it's not. Better brakes and calipers, that's not factory. Okay, but, and this is something that uh, most guys would never consider doing that really needs to be done when you combine all of this, okay? Everything that's bolt on bolts to the factory locations. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Ah, uh, that's debatable. The problem is what you're doing by replacing all of these components and putting them all in the factory location is all we're doing is updating our Camaro or our Firebird to maybe, maybe the equivalent of a 2018 Toyota Camry. Maybe. All right. So where does that leave us? Well, let's talk about the rear and then we'll come back to this. If we stick with the factory leaf springs, what are our options? Okay, we can put aftermarket springs. All right, what else can we do? Better shocks. What else? That's pretty much it, okay? We could add a sway bar. What else can we do? That's it. There really is nothing else you can do about this. The beauty of leaf springs is they're simple. The downside to leaf springs is they're simple and they don't really have a whole lot of You've got very little adjustability because in order to change a spring rate, you have to change the leaf spring. That goes to the aftermarket springs. If you don't like that uh, spring rate, you have no choice but to replace the leaf springs again. That can get expensive after a while. Um, there are some downsides to leaf springs, a leaf spring suspension. One of the biggies is what's called axle wrap. And so things we can add to leaf springs, a lot of it comes from axle wrap and wheel hop. Both of these are related in a way, okay? Axle wrap generally is on acceleration. What happens and why? Well, if you look at a, a very generic leaf spring, okay? And our third member in here, okay, with a drive shaft. All right. On acceleration, the pinion, since it's set below the ring gear, 
as it turns, it's going to want to make the pinion is going to want to climb up the ring gear. Well, it can't because it's rigid in the housing. So what that means is the housing is going to rotate nose up. All right. So what does that do to the spring? It's going to want to make the spring. You're putting a torsional twist on the spring like this. It's going to want to make this part of the spring twist that way. It's going to want to make that part of the spring twist that way. Not so much in the rear, it's mainly focused in the front. Okay, and that's called axle wrap. And uh, basically, you lose traction, you can get wheel hop on acceleration uh, because as you, you uh, lose traction, the wheels start spinning, the spring violently unloads, and then you gain traction, and then it loads again. And then you lose traction and then it violently unloads and then you gain traction and it's that vicious cycle okay so what are the things we can do to prevent this from happening on acceleration basically you have traction bars uh, ladder bars things like this all right wheel hop on de on deceleration is essentially the same thing except it happens under braking and you have basically the same thing happening, except now your forces are reversed. Gain traction, lose traction, gain traction, lose traction, etc. cetera. Um, all of this is all designed to tame leaf springs because leaf springs are not good for performance. And there's just no two ways about it. You don't see any race cars out there other than nostalgia cars that are still running leaf springs. Or if they are, they've got a whole bunch of money tied up in all of these parts right here to try and tame the original design, which was never designed for performance in the first place. All right. That's enough lessons for today. What are we going to do about this? You probably figured out by now that I'm not really a big fan of leaf springs. And as a result, the decision was a pretty easy one to uh, get rid of the leaf springs on the uh, rebuild on the Firebird. But we got to have something. So what are our options? Let's go back to the board and take a look at them. Option one, keep leaf springs. Not doing it. Option two. Well, let's take a look at what other types of rear suspension we have available to us. Um, we could go with a four link. What else could we do? What other options are there? We could go with uh, truck arms. Okay. Probably not a uh, really viable option on the Firebird. What else do we got? We could go um, IRS. Again, for the Firebird, I have uh, researched. A company is making a uh, bolt-in uh, IRS setup for the second-gen uh, Camaro Firebird. Seriously high bucks so we just don't have independent rear suspension in the budget I've got my thoughts on independent rear suspension as well that's for another day okay so what other options do we have um, last but not least we have a three link okay um, I'm not going into today what each one of these systems uh, how it operates but because of space limitations and other issues, truck arms, pretty much not really an option. Um, there are some fairly good four-link setups um, available uh, to retrofit into the uh, F-bodies, but they have their upsides and downsides, and it's a lot of fabrication work, which I'm not afraid of, but for various reasons, I'm not going to do the four-link. Okay, which leaves us a three link. Okay, so what is a three link? So in a three link, you have 
You're a third member with a drive shaft. Uh, at some point you have some brackets coming down off of the housing and you have a bar or a link that attaches to your chassis, okay? So this is one, the other side is two, and then you have some form of link on a true three link, you have some form of link that connects the top of the housing up here somewhere, there's a bracket up here somewhere, that will connect to the center of the chassis. Okay, so that's the third link. And of course, you also have the pan hard bar for lateral location. This system works as good as a four link does, but what do we have with the suspension setup on the 2000 Z28? Okay, we have essentially a quasi three link, except that instead of having the third link to the housing, we have basically a rigid torque arm bolted to the housing, okay? And then the torque arm pivots at the tail shaft of the transmission, all right? So what that does is that eliminates axle wrap by rigidly holding the third member in a position relative to the pivot point at the transmission. So essentially, the suspension setup we have with the Z28 is a quasi third link to begin with. So I'm going with this. For those of you that have stuck with me throughout this entire episode, thanks. Um, hope I didn't bore you too bad. Maybe, uh, hopefully, one or two of you might have learned something. I did. I'm always learning. Um, you wouldn't believe the amount of research that I had to go back through and kind of relearn in some cases just so I didn't sound like a complete idiot. So, uh, for the next few weeks, now that I have the plan down on paper, in my head, on the board, uh, written on the walls, we can move forward with uh, doing the fabrication necessary to get the uh, suspension set up in the Firebird. Certainly appreciate everybody watching. Big thanks to all you guys. Please like, share, and subscribe. It certainly does help me out. Everybody, have a great day.